My name is Eileen Murphy, and I am from Think Circa. Previous to being at Think Circa, I was actually at Chicago Public Schools, where I was the director of curriculum and instruction for about 115 schools. And um, I actually worked for an office that was created by Arnie Duncan. Uh, it was called the Office of Autonomous Schools, and we had over 100,000 students that we were responsible for. Before that, I'd done, you know, I I taught for many years and be, actually started the um, uh, Walter Payton College Prep, which is a name that that our neighbors in Wisconsin probably know because if you are in Wisconsin, you know all about the, the Green Bay Packers and the Bears, and he is definitely one of the most legendary players. But it is actually the number one school in Illinois now. I'm happy to say, and um, I essentially focused for the past. Um, I don't know how many years, I guess 20 total, on college prep reading and writing. And uh, while at the central office in that position, I also helped roll out the Common Core Standards, and we did, it, we did that quite early, um, while, while schools were still actually accountable for other assessments. So I called in friends who had been focused, and you all probably know Doug Buell, because he's a Wisconsin guru of adolescent reading and uh, specifically reading in the disciplines. He's wonderful. He became a, an advisor and a colleague. He, he'd come in and do professional development for us, as did Catherine McKnight, who has worked with CESA 7 in Wisconsin and developed curriculum there, does a lot of work with differentiation. Gerald Graff, who is um, the author of They Say, I Say, the number one best-selling college composition book, and he's mentioned in the Common Core Standards. He's cited in the, the piece on argumentation as well as Doug O'Rourke, who is a, the founder of the graduate program in math and science education at the University of Chicago. And I guess uh, together we tried to take what we were doing at Peyton, which was dealing with a, a more wide range of students than, than that that currently goes to Peyton, and we focused on getting them career and college ready um, through an all honors and AP program. And, and again, the, the students coming in weren't typically there. So I got really focused on the very things that the Common Core was asking. And I, I actually wrote a book on close reading and argumentation right around that same time. So I'm taking now w w the work that we did on paper that had significant impact on Explore Plan and ACT scores and moving it to technology. So we just finished our, our first year of implementation um, in the technology piece. We actually had it in private beta two years ago, but this first full-blown year um, was really about getting ready to help teachers not only personalize learning for growth, for individual growth, but also to prepare for the new assessments. So I think everyone here is um, excited to learn more about uh, Smarter Balanced as well as Aspire, and I'm going to walk through the details of those assessments. But I also want to say that we, we are grounding it in the conversation of growth that will continue, because obviously teacher and principal accountability is still tied to individual student growth, which is one of the challenges, but also I think one of the great opportunities that we as kind of turn of the century, 21st century educators have, which is that we, we have some tools and resources that were never available for us before to help us on scale really improve all student achievement. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. So we recognize that the standards are challenging and that just because we have new standards and new assessments doesn't mean that we have new schools, um, new kids, <laughs> new schedules, new, you know, pay structures, all of the things that, that make up education policy haven't all changed, um, but a few significant pieces have. So we're trying to sort of help teachers really in a practical way bridge the gap between the high standards and the diversity of students. So this is obviously an extreme classroom picture where we see students who, and, and again, this is data from NWEA MAP, um, an assessment that again, many schools are still accountable for. Um, and will be throughout this next school year. Um, and we see students who walk in along this really, you know, kind of uh, high-pitched bell curve. Students who are super high-performing, um, six kids above the 95th percentile, 25 kids on track for AP success, and then students who are very low-performing, 10 students below the fourth percentile. And without differentiation, and sadly, this is actually one of the schools that I really did work with um, and try to improve instruction and and just the availability of resources for differentiation. Um, because what we saw here was that students were sliding back. And they were sliding back for a couple of reasons. So the highest performing students were being challenged and the lowest performing students were encountering work that was 
uh, meant to be more accessible, but in some cases became less engaging, less rigorous, because it was, for example, rewritten passages versus an authentic text, um, work that was done in isolation and focused on skills rather than ideas, et cetera. Um, and so what we try to do is obviously prepare all students for this, the new standards, which are challenging. They focus on rigorous cognitive tasks and also complex texts. Um, but also recognize that students are not all working at the same grade level and we need to make that accessible. So this is an example of what happens when you do that. All students grow regardless of where they walk in. Doesn't mean everyone's gonna master the Common Core State Standards on day one, but obviously we have an opportunity to cause growth and that is what we're focused on in addition to preparing for the assessments. So just to give you a snapshot of the impact that we've had this year, in helping schools with Common Core, but also, um, again, this measure, the NWEA MAP test, we had students grow in a fifth grade class, and we have many of these case studies, 2.2 years, and um, they're part of a, found uh, a study that the Gates Foundation is doing along with SRI, um, where they're measuring the impact of things circa on student growth and, um, and achievement on the Common Core. And so you can see the impact where students went from the 41st percentile in growth to the 87th percentile. So as we talk about the assessments, we're also talking about um, students achieving um, more. Um, sorry, this is actually the one where students went from 41st percentile to 87th percentile in growth. So this is a, a group of middle school students who achieved just tremendous growth in one year with Think Circa. And this is a solution that this principal brought in to address the Common Core, prepare for the assessments, but also to meet the needs of students. And so our approach is pretty simple. We basically focus on what the Common Core standards focus on, which is uh, analytical reading and um, evidence-based argumentation. And so it's really just evidence, evidence, evidence-based reading and writing. Um, so this is actually a quote from, from our um, Gerald Graff, who, like I said, is cited in the standards, but the about 80% of the standards can be assessed by having a student make a claim, support it with evidence, explain their reasoning, address a counter-argument, and use audience-appropriate language. Um, I was actually just meeting with Doug O'Rourke from the University of Chicago um, as we prepare a presentation for about 100 principals here in Chicago where we're training people on the standards. And, um, and his argument is that all, all of the mathematical standards are actually subordinate to mathematical practice standard number three, which is the ability to construct a viable argument and critique the reasoning of others. And really what this means, you know, the ability to make a good argument about something is effective communication. It's about being able to speak, write, and read effectively. Um, and listen effectively so that um, you can learn, but also demonstrate your competence and knowledge in an area effectively. So that's kind of the Circa framework, and that covers about 80% of the standards. And I would say that if you look at any of the assessments, which we will in a moment, you'll see it covers 100% of the assessment items. Um, our technology obviously has students work in, in different modalities that also mirror the modalities that they'll be assessed in. But the reason that there is such similarity between um, our work, Think Circa, and, the, and the, the new assessments is that we were all working from the same research, which was decades old, that showed that students who were more career and college ready were kids who wrote papers across uh, classes five or more times per month. They discussed um, and improved writing with the class or partners. They used evidence or data to support an argument or hypothesis, and this is all the same research that influenced the design of the standards along with research that suggests, and this is where the classroom strategies have to come in, that the difference between students who are high performing in reading and students who are not meeting those benchmarks was not their ability to do rigorous cognitive tasks, but actually their ability to read complex texts. And we'll talk a little bit about what text complexity means because as you look at the assessment items, you'll see that, um, that sort of rewriting the passages and making it simpler and simpler is actually not the way to grow students in the Common Core era. It's not gonna be the way that students will be successful on these new assessments. Um, it is, uh, you know, it has a place in a school, but it is not necessarily what we want students, even who, those who are performing much further below grade level than we'd like them to. We don't want to um, kind of withhold complex text or authentic text. 
what we want to do is make sure that we scaffold the students' awareness of background knowledge and vocab and make um, peers assets in their learning. And, there, and you know, when I, when I say making peers assets in our learning, I, I'm suggesting that the focus of argumentation not only gives students a really simple critical lens, but it also gives students a set of components to work from that are, that are easy to remember, they're easy to work with. It also gives students a natural engagement in like nothing else can. And, and there isn't a video game or um, any kind of point system that is more powerful to a student than an engaged peer who engages them with a different point of view that is valid and responsive to the point of view that they've presented. And that is why the students who have um, most recently in the NAEP data demonstrated the highest success rates were the kids who discussed interpretations of what they read every day or almost every day. So while we'll talk about assessments and we'll talk about technology, um, we'll also talk about the importance of complex texts rigorous argumentation tasks, and peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Um, so that's kind of the research base. Um, one last thing on text complexity, and I want to just address Lexile because it's something that often comes up. So I want to sort of lay the groundwork for how um, Counting Poor thinks about text complexity, um, which obviously um, uh, Sorry, I think I, I accidentally muted myself there. Not good. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, text complexity goes beyond Lexile um, because, as the standards note, there is um, element. There are elements of the text that can't be captured in um, just an algorithm. There are ideas, there are themes, there are um, structures that can't be captured there. So we just use these as examples of where Captain Underpants actually has a higher Lexile than Farewell to Arms. We know that's not true. Um, I also use the example of the Halo blog that you know children who are in second grade who are interested in this video game can read, and I can't read. The Lexile happens to be above college level. Um, now back to the assessments. So you kind of have a sense of the research. Um, and I think it's really important to be kind of regrounded in that research and in the, the reality of classrooms before we look at the assessments so you can think about classroom strategies that will help us achieve. Um, so the focus is 100% on evidence-based reading and writing in these new assessments. So I'm going to just start um, kind of rattling through sample items on Aspire. Aspire is, of course, designed by ACT. And it is at once very similar to ACT and very, very different um, in, in the sense that you'll still see the same complex text, but now you'll probably see multiple texts in one item. So in this, in this case, a student is going to be reading a, a narrative. It was always presented on Explore Plan and ACT, but now in addition to reading one narrative, they'll read a second one and they'll be asked to then identify similarities between the texts. So identify one way in which the gray cub's life in the passage from White Fang differs from the horse's life in the excerpt of Black Beauty. Use one detail from the passage and one detail from the excerpt to support your answer. So that's a grade six item. Um, so this is where students are obviously going to be challenged in a number of different ways, well beyond comprehension. And this is why students need exposure to complex texts to, you know, probably some great works of literature that are older so that they can kind of work their way around some of these passages. Um, Jack London is a great writer, incredibly compelling, but the vocab is difficult, as, as all of us who have read him know. Um, the same with Black Beauty. Obviously, we're looking at some syntax and word choice that's going to be pretty challenging for students who have never been exposed to anything other than contemporary literature or nonfiction. So that's something to keep in mind. There's comparative analysis, and there's always evidence required for student answers, whether they're open-ended or multiple choice. Here's an example from Smarter Balanced. Um, so in the evidence-based reading um, assessment item for grade seven for Smarter Balanced, you see, again, the complex texts. This is a sort of social science science focus where we're learning about fish in Honduras. Um, we're asked a part A and a part B, which is a new med modality as well. So not only are students not used to open-ended questions, they're also not used to typing out their answers um, on a keyboard, and they're certainly not used to having 
um, a part A that's then going to impact their ability to choose the correct answer in part B. But that is what we're going to be practicing with students. So in this case, the students are asked what's the most likely, what's, what is most likely the author's intent? And um, essentially, they're, they're taking an, an author's choice, um, mentioning blind fish. And then they're asking in part B, after the student has identified the intention of the author, going back to audience and the idea of purpose, um, we're basically uh, then asked to provide evidence. So which sentence from the text best illustrates the inference made in part A? So a couple of things about this item. Number one, the modality of part A, part B. Number two, the awareness that I think really takes time to build in a student's mind that an author is making, that I always say, uh, of writing is reading in reverse, and reading is writing in reverse. So there is an author who has intended something and has made a choice. That's a concept that students don't typically kind of um, develop uh, very early, something that um, can be facilitated by that peer-to-peer -peer workshop because we start practicing thinking about authors making choices, even by doing peer-to-peer -peer workshops with um, other student writers. And then if we can make that explicit connection to just like the student writer you're helping with their paper, there are these authors making choices. You can start to build that conceptual understanding. Um, and obviously, it's the text that speaks to author's intent. And sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's not. Um, but again, we're, we're doing evidence-based reading in both of these cases. Um, again, we have another sort of open-ended um, ELA item where we're then taking um, a, an inference about a narrator's feeling and writing an open-ended essay. So this is, um, again, sort of a social science item where we're basically doing evidence-based character analysis. Um, so this is um, a little bit about Pony Express, so some cultural literacy at work here. And this is why I think um, many of us have experienced over time this sort of focus on reading informational texts because it's often the lowest score on current assessments. And of course, the reason isn't because they can't read a sentence that was written in a fictional or, or non-fiction text, text um, because somehow there's crazy syntax or something. It's actually more about understanding the content or the or bringing the vocabulary or knowledge of how those texts work to the reading. So in this case, we are hearing about somebody um, who worked for Pony Express. So being able to picture that, um, understand that, appreciate it, and then um, make an inference about it. Um, essentially, um, the uh, next item is audio analysis. And um, in this case, the students are being asked to um, listen to um, an excerpt of Around the World in 70, 72 Days. Um, this is in the public domain. And again, I'm just going to comment on the exposure to our more, you know, sort of older texts. Because public domain for a publisher of assessments also equals free. I think we're going to see those on assessments. We always have and, and we probably always will. So exposing students to some non-contemporary readings, I think, is important for a lot of reasons. Plus, you know, they're, they're, they're still around because they're probably pretty awesome, like uh, <laughs> Jack London. But they're also something that they're going to be able to use on the test. So in this case, they have somebody reading it. And we're going to do another part A, part B. What conclusion about the speaker is best supported by evidence from the presentation? And which quotation from the presentation best supports your answer? Um, analyzing text in those ways is, again, a totally new modality. So when we create our lessons, um, we are thinking about these. We actually, on our free platform, thinkcircuit.com, you can um, assess a student's ability to um, read a video critically, listen critically, um, look at an infographic critically, um, and of course, lots of informational texts in science and social science. But it does take practice to listen critically. Um, again, in this, um, oops, sorry, um, in this uh, ACT Aspire sample, we see another new modality. And this is, um, I think, a really interesting use of technology for assessment. Uh, I have to say that, that both Aspire and, and Smarter Balance are, are definitely truly assessing these standards um, with precision. And in this case, it's a social science passage 
again, a fairly challenging one. Um, and the student is being asked to apply chronological thinking, which is something that is in the social science standards. Um, and they're expressing that chronological knowledge or that, that ability to kind of untangle something that wasn't presented in chronological order through a drag and drop modality. So um, essentially what we see here is, um, you know, students doing sophisticated literacy across disciplines and doing, you know, being assessed in new modalities. So we're completing a sequence chart and, um, you know, filling in the, or, or um, you know, making assumptions about the correct order. Um, so well beyond comprehension. Also, we go back to author's intention and we see in this Aspire sample complex text where they're being asked about author's um, choices. So what is the purpose of this particular paragraph in, you know, that, be, um, that shifts from one idea to another. So noticing the moves of a text is something that is that close analytical reading that we haven't in the past decades spent a lot of time doing. And um, while we obviously provide lessons that do this very thing, we also, um, I always kind of remind everyone that we encourage a balance of volume reading so that we're giving the students that sea of words and that fluency with close reading. So um, as we continue to talk about close reading and evidence-based reading and writing, we also want to keep in mind that students won't get that literate unless they're reading uh, what we would recommend, which is from grades four to 12, at least 150 pages a week. And that includes novels, and novels are included on the assessments. So here's an, an, a smarter balanced in high school, and I know you guys are actually in Wisconsin not doing the high school assessment, but just to give you a sense of where we're ending up in the continuum, this is an excerpt from Life of Pi. Again, we have a part A, part B, and again, we have evidence-based uh, character analysis. So we're looking for details from the text that support a claim about a character. Those are not skills that you develop in one year or that you develop and then you check it and you move on in a pacing guide, as we all know. None of these standards can be sliced and diced very easily. So we're looking for um, complexity and rigor in the instruction. And this kind of um, instruction is what is what leads to um, you know, students developing these sophisticated vocabularies, background knowledge, voc um, cultural literacy that, that includes an awareness of, you know, significant events in history and uh, key writers, et cetera. Um, so in this case, they're asked um, the stories, what do the stories of survival in last paragraph suggest to the reader about the narrator? Again, evidence-based character analysis. So when you um, sort of approach the task of selecting texts, I think I just gave you a pretty good picture of the authenticity that's required, the range in terms of dates in which you know, these pieces were written so that we're exposing students to some old, some new. Also the, um, you know, the different genres, because I compare it sort of to um, driving in a foreign city which I personally actually am really still afraid to do, so maybe this is a bad analogy, but if you are somebody who knows how to drive and you know that a red means stop and a green means go, um, you can sort of make your way around another city as long as there's some basic road signs that look familiar to you. Um, doesn't mean you feel safe, it doesn't mean you feel comfortable always, but you can do it. And um, one of the things that we have to work with our students to be able to do is to persist in difficulty because you and I read things that are hard to read every day. Um, we figure it out because we know sort of the moves to make within a given text. And that's what we try to do with students. So our approach to leveling is actually to provide these authentic texts and just provide authentic ones at a different range and then provide evidence-based argumentation opportunities by giving each student a different point of view. And I'll talk more about it later, but I just wanted to point out that you don't develop those skills of reading complex texts um, by periodic exposure to authenticity and then a, you know constant exposure to rewrites or things that have been simplified for you. Um, you, you develop that complex knowledge and language sophistication by, by exposure over time. I want to um, dig in a little bit to the science tasks because I'm going to go back to this other screen. Look, for example, at the modality um, in terms of the number of, of items that are related in this, set, in this passage. Um, so in this case, it's kind of a research simulation. It is grade four, and students have three tasks on this particular um, 
item. So part one is giving um, multiple sources and um, they're pulling out the scenario where the school science fair is taking place soon and you've been given these sources, you've reviewed them, you'll have an opportunity to answer questions about them and then in part two you write an informational article using information that you gathered there. So um, you're essentially selecting the most valid source. You're often given sources that um, speak to the same issue and you're supposed to figure out uh, which pieces of evidence most um, clearly support those claims. Uh, so you have some open-ended and you're evaluating the relative, or, sorry, the relevance, the authority, the um, specificity, various aspects of evaluating evidence. And in some cases, you're also matching. So the, even the automated assessments are really focused, again, in a different kind of modality, but the same cognitive task. So you're evaluating a claim, you're evaluating sources, um, evidence to support that claim, and you are matching those items. So you can have multiple right answers. Um, some animals have developed special body features that help them survive in the place where they live. Source one, two, and three may um, actually apply. So your job is to evaluate that. So that's how that auto assessment works. This, I have to say, is one of the most fascinating pieces of these new assessments in my mind, which is that the uh, science passages that have been released, the science samples, sorry, that have been released from Aspire indicate an emphasis on peer-to-peer -peer argumentation in science as well. Um, which, by the way, if you're interested, if you're a science person or buff uh, in terms of literacy research or science literacy research, Jonathan Osborne at, the, um, at Stanford University has done great work on the importance of argumentation in a science classroom and also the importance of language in, in science content knowledge acquisition. So in one article, he argues that if you take away the language of science, you take away um, you know, the language of biology, you take away knowledge of biology. So it's a view of language as kind of knowledge that I think is, is really significant in thinking about instruction in, in the 21st century, because obviously we cannot um, teach our students everything they need to know or be able to do, but what we can do is teach them how to evaluate sources effectively, how to then express their critical thinking about those sources effectively, and engage with others in sort of problem solving. When you think about the possibility of students going to universities that are remote or web-based and developing study groups outside of a traditional classroom, these skills are really critical and they're, they're being assessed here on the ACT Aspire. So we see um, an, a grade seven example where the students are given a couple of claims um, and then students are then, um, you're sort of evaluating the argument from one student's point of view versus another student's point of view about the, um, how the water droplets form on the outside of a bottle of hot water. And we were evaluating the evidence that students bring to this argument. Again, another science one, in Smarter Balanced, we see a grade seven item where source one, source two, we're again matching the sources to the claims. So again, evidence-based argumentation everywhere we turn. Um, so it's uh, you know a couple of items that are presented to students and they're matching and evaluating the sources for their relevance to the claims. Um, same here, we have an open-ended example. A teacher tells them what the characteristics are in grade eight of um, a living thing, and the argument is about whether or not viruses are living things. And so, um, again, they're given student responses, and then they're asked to um, figure out which student would be likely to agree with that point of view, and they have to explain their answers. So again, it's about some pretty sophisticated skills in terms of science literacy, because not only do they need to comprehend and understand the science, but they also have to comprehend and understand the multiple viewpoints about that information and be able to respond to them, evaluate, take them apart, put them back together. So these are the kinds of things that are mimicking the practices that are found in the research that says this is what makes kids college ready. So I think there was a you know, clear intentionality behind the writing of the standards where we're being measured, I guess, our success is being measured on the very practices that we know will actually get students more career and college ready. So while they're a little bit challenging and sometimes people go, oh my God, my students won't ever be able to do this. I think that we have to think about these as um, you know, standards that are teachable and achievable 
um, the, though we really haven't been explicit about teaching them and, and achieving them in the past, I think that some of these things are very, very teachable and explicitly teachable. Um, here's an example again of a grade nine science, uh, grade nine, 10 science literacy piece where again, the students are given an incorrect, you know, claim that was incorrect and um, they're asked to explain um, why it was incorrect. So again, they have to process the science. They also then have to figure out the argument that was made and then develop a responsive counter argument to that claim. So again, going back to that framework, I think every item you've seen in Aspire Smarter Balance, you'll see that there is always a claim and an evidence. There's that audience awareness piece in terms of author intentionality, which is also tied to reasoning. But we also see clearly throughout um, all of these questions, the counter argument, the idea that we really don't live in a world where the choices are four and one of them is correct. We live in a world where there are many plausible explanations and um, sometimes more than one correct answer. So really embedding that practice in classrooms where students are challenging each other to think critically about text, not only engages them in the very skills that they'll be assessed on and, and, and in the skills that the real world will sort of measure their success upon, but also from the you know 15 year veteran teacher point of view, it's actually just way more engaging for the kids. And um, that is, you know, I think why we teach, because we certainly didn't sign up for the riches and fame. We did it because we actually wanted kids to be excited about what we were talking about. So um, last couple of pieces, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, ACT and Smarter Balance still test grammar and, and writing. Um, so there are um, some rhetorical analysis pieces where um, students have to select a sentence, for example, in this item on Smarter Balance in grade seven, a sentence that adds the best transition between the two paragraphs. So um, they read the two paragraphs, comprehend them, and then think rhetorically, which one of these ties the sentence or the two paragraphs together most effectively. Um, they are given also an opportunity to um, write from a set of notes a body paragraph that matches an introductory paragraph and a conclusion paragraph. So that's a really interesting assessment. So again, when we think about um, the overall purpose or the overall claim of a piece and how to develop an evidence-based argument to support that claim, we see the whole and then we see the parts of the whole that um, support that. And so that's why, again, when we use the framework, it's pretty simple. You have big claims supported by big reasons, and then you have paragraphs that are really sort of like subclaims that support those, those big ideas and build an argument to support those claims. And that's exactly what they're being assessed on here, an evidence-based paragraph. Um, we also see, um, sorry, we also see the persuasive essay, which is one kind of argumentation. Um, this one is not necessarily based on evidence, it is actually based on, in this case, I would say life experience. Um, the question is, should Kim keep taking extra French less language lessons? Consider the positions below as you think about how you would answer this question. Um, she loves speaking French, um, but she wants, to, she wants to keep doing it, but she doesn't want to do poorly in her classes, and, and it's asking her to do, uh, it's demanding. So they're supposed to basically write a persuasive essay which will involve their own, you know, critical thinking about a real life example and obviously the effective expression of critical thinking, logic, organization, effective expressions of language and their, um, you know, expressing their viewpoint. There's vocab and grammar. This looks very much like the old ACT tests, um, which aren't old because actually in a lot of places we're still taking them, but it's the vocab and grammar stuff. It's you know, is while this the right transition at the beginning of this sentence to connect it to the rest of the text? Um, it's a multiple choice item. Here, um, and again, I find this one really interesting. This is Smarter Balanced at grade 11, which I know you won't be necessarily doing in Wisconsin, but good to know that, again, the continuum brings students through to grade 11, 12, where they're going to be able to write, um, they want, write something that acknowledges a counterclaim to the argument introduced here. And the argument that was introduced was about a school board's plan um, to wear electronic identification tags. And so again, it's sort of a real life application of skills, but they're given a set of student notes from credible sources. They're given um, the Fourth Amendment, et cetera, and they're being asked to write an argument that is responsive. 
And I think, you know, that idea of counterargument, um, the idea that counterarguments that are powerful respond to the issue that is um, kind of beneath another person's claim. The same issue is at the core of um, both sides of this argument. And that is something that, again, takes some disciplined thinking over time to develop. Um, so it's about relevance and responsiveness. Um, this uh, piece here is just an example of, you know, the word choice, again, audience awareness, author intentionality, wants to acknowledge a counterclaim introduced in the paragraph, um, and, you know, which words are going to be most effective in connecting them to the counter argument. Um, the audience awareness kind of pervades throughout. So responsiveness in the counter arguments um, is all tied up with the idea of making an argument that's significant to the audience, um, a conclusion that best explains the significance of the informational text. Why is this relevant? The so what kind of part of writing. Um, and let's see, I have a couple more and then we can move on. This is, um, again, another matching uh, you know, sources evaluating and then matching them to claims. We've seen a couple of these already, so I won't spend any more time on that. Um, this is a good old-fashioned grammar and punctuation item um, where we're, again, picking a correct um, version of a sentence. So that explicit instruction of grammar is something that's not going to go away. It has in some states gone away, and now it's coming back. Narrative writing hasn't gone away either. Here's an example of, a, of an Aspire piece. Now, this is grade three, and again, many of you won't be taking the elementary versions of Aspire, at least not in the immediate future. But good to know that, um, again, the narrative is still part of our standards, and students will be assessed on them in all of the assessments. So the students are writing a story. And again, we, we kind of think of narratives as claims that are supported by descriptive details and evidence. Um, but they're describing a time they tried something new. Literacy across subjects. I'm just going to briefly touch on math. Um, and again, this goes back to um, significantly more challenging open-ended mathematical questions, a lot of short answer. Um, so we're given a figure and um, we're asked to describe a sequence of basic transformations in the order they are performed. So um, you're basically using deep conceptual understanding in this grade eight math sample, deep conceptual understanding of a mathematical process, which requires, of course, deep conceptual understanding of the words that we use to describe mathematical processes. So um, this is not hand out a vocab sheet and um, memorize those words. This is understand math and um, understand mathematical concepts. And I will help you put labels on those concepts that will make you an effective person in terms of um, being mathematically literate and being capable of making a viable argument and critiquing the reasoning of others, which I'm sure most of us understand that in the world of work, Many students will be faced with, you know, true mathematical challenges with real-world applications and be asked to make mathematical arguments in many professions. Uh, here's an example of a, a graph in another open-ended, um, uh, you know, um, image, and the student is asked to identify the equation of the circle whose interior represents. So it's not pick the right answer. It is identify the equation that will help you get to the right answer. So again real world mathematical knowledge and the application of mathematical knowledge versus just the um, kind of memorization of content or um, you know the rote practice of skills. Um, here's a grade 12 smarter balanced again may not be as, as relevant but again to show you where we're going. Um, we don't have a picture of the circle in this item. We're given a circle that has a center of 6, 7 and goes through 0.14. This is a mathematical description of a circle, not a graphic representation of a circle. So again, it's like that real world application. Um, a lot of explaining. Um, explain the, you know, why the dash line drawn in the figure below is not a line of symmetry for the figure. Mathematical understanding, mathematical language. Um, and then lastly, I think we've already touched on some of the social science pieces, but, um, you know, again, we're looking at for both Aspire and Smarter Balance, the Part A, Part B, evidence-based reading, and, um, you know, text that supports conclusions about author's purpose, 
Um, this is, again, very similar to former ACTs, et cetera, but um, not going away. So we see, again, author's purpose and um, that chronological thinking, which I also touched on already. So I'm just going to wrap up really quickly by um, letting you know that we have obviously put together resources that are there to help teachers focus on growth and achieve these new standards. So we have many lessons that provide the introduction to key skills and concepts. We have um, uh, close reading and academic writing practice in our core um, offering, which is these differentiated um, kind of very um, uh, well, kind of deep understanding of a topic, ending with an evidence-based argument kind of approach. And then we have the supplemental passages that are in multimedia formats, as well as traditional passages that are read. And we always use the same questioning framework, which is what's the claim of this text? What evidence does the author use to support it? And it doesn't matter if we're watching a TED talk or looking at an infographic, we're asking those same questions. How do they express their reasoning and connect that evidence to their claim? How do they address counter arguments? And um, as they choose the words that they use to reach their audience effectively, um, you know, what are your noticings? There's also the ability for a teacher to take their own current existing awesome content, which shouldn't go out the window just because we have new standards, and you know, apply evidence-based reading and writing practices by putting it into our platform. So you can just pop in a text or a video or an image and have students use the same tools we use to do evidence-based argument in our program um, in there. And then we also have the data that can be captured. We, of course, have formative assessments. We have vocabulary assessments. We have additional practice assessments on all of these, these skills. But essentially, we start with the uh, mini lesson, which students can do in a flipped environment. I know a lot of Wisconsin schools have BYOD. Students who have one-to-one -one access can do these you know, very easily from home and come to class ready to collaborate and, and receive help from a teacher. There's audio support. There's an assessment. There's strong visuals to give instant feedback and um, you know, a way to grasp these difficult concepts, which they will then apply as they get a differentiated lesson at their level of readiness with a, um, a, a, a complex text. So the way we level the text, as I mentioned, we use all authentic text from the best publications, such as the New York Times, Smithsonian Magazine, National Geographic, and um, you know, obviously great literature as well. And um, we ask essential questions. So this is that sort of approach um, to understanding by design, where we take an essential question, such as what role should the government play in the health of its citizens? And you know, we have 10 levels of text. So one student might be reading about how the government banned large sugary drinks and say, hey, they said that was unconstitutional, while another student working at a different level of readiness um, now can offer a responsive counter argument by saying, well, yeah, but when they banned trans fats in New York, it actually worked to improve the health of its citizens, and so it was actually better for taxpayers and for the citizens. Well, that's an example of where you can create evidence-based argumentation and peer-to-peer -peer collaboration dynamics in the classroom to increase engagement, but also to practice the very skills that they're being assessed on. One of the big challenges that students will have in the writing and in the speaking and listening portions of, of Common Core, and I would say in life, <laughs> is that um, a lot of the conceptual and abstract language isn't built into the kids when they walk in the door on day one, because they may not be hearing them at home. They're certainly not consuming them in most media. So we've gone to um, kind of explicitly teaching the words that they will need to express their reasoning. So if you read The Road Not Taken, for example, you're not gonna see the word consequence in the poem but you might need that word to effectively express your thinking about the poem. So we sort of teach that in our topic overview. We always make a personal connection to the text. There's always audio support and in-text vocabulary to support reading at um, perhaps a higher level than you're capable of independently with paper. But um, you know, we ask you to take then a comprehension check. And then uh, we have you highlight and annotate the text so that you're capable of finding the evidence in the text and finding the multiple right answers, et cetera. So in this case, we have the um, story of a boy soldier, and we're asking students to meet the standard, which was to evaluate um, you know, this, this, this um, piece of a memoir, and they're highlighting specific aspects of the text that they're going to be asked to discuss in the standard when we assess it. Um, and then they're annotating to express reasoning, and of course, 
this is the kind of evidence-based reading that they're going to need to do to be able to support any conclusion that they make about the text in the, um, in the tests. Um, but really the magic comes in when we have students collaborating. This is where math, science, English, et cetera, the active classroom, and we can share some really great videos of students having these awesome debates. It is, you know, the, the question of how far should the government go in the health of its citizens? I mean, really, should they be able to tell us what we should be able to eat and drink? This is a really engaging topic, and kids going back to multiple texts to make those arguments is, is something that we facilitate through an interactive argument builder. So this, the kids are physically dragging and dropping and making tactically their own argument, thinking critically through this kind of technology-enabled process. And as a result, they're actually um, going through what I think is the important um, the distinction between writing to prove learning and writing to improve learning. So they're really, through this process of pre-writing, going through the process of really understanding the topic that they're writing about. And then engaging with peers, which again, deepens their understanding and fills their minds and their mouths with those conceptual words and more fully developed thoughts so that when they go to um, you know, work on their own argument, they have it. It, of course, is the kind of practice that we see assessed on Smarter Balanced and Aspire. It's that peer-to-peer -peer argumentation. So after they build their arguments, engage with peers in collaborative discussions, we then ask them to do um, one of the key pieces of argumentation is summarizing. What else has been said about this topic? Let me state that first and then position my claim in relation to it. But again, because students aren't necessarily exposed to academic English and professional English, what we do is teach it explicitly. It's not hard to learn. It's just that maybe only the, the top percentage of us have picked it up over time. So we've decided that actually it's a moat that pretty much anybody can cross if we point it out to them. So we're big fans of providing students with these academic language stems and providing them kind of the cognitive opportunity to summarize using the stem, but also the, uh, you know, developing the sophistication in their oral expression and their written expression of ideas. We then, you know, introduce more of those that are specific to developing the claims, specific to introducing evidence and reasoning and connecting one's argument. Um, and then at the bottom, which is not shown in the screenshot, we actually always have a model that is discipline specific because it doesn't sound the same to write um, in science as it does to write in social science or in English. So we like to model that as well. And we take authentic texts. Um, essentially, um, we then provide students with a rubric and the rubric um, is, uh, you know, there so students can do a self-assessment so that they can take ownership of those standards and their own progress. But then it matches obviously the um, paperless grading system that teachers will use when the students then submit their work. And because the CERCA framework applies across all disciplines, it essentially gives students um, what I, what I say is, and what Gerald Graff would call um, cluelessness is removed. Meaning, you know, when we talk about reading and writing, we're talking about the expression of somebody's thinking, somebody's critical thinking. So we cannot tell you how to write anything. All we can do is allow you to express your critical thinking and then give you feedback on whether or not you did it effectively. And so when we give it different words like the hamburger paragraph or the you know, the Toolman method, which I always found really challenging to teach to students and to teachers, um, we're just calling it what it is, and we're calling it what we use these words in the, re in the real life, but also in the standards, claim, evidence, reason, counter reason, audience. It works in math, it works in science, it works in social science, it works in English. And that way, an instructional leader can see the student's progress and performance across a school. And they can say, well, you know, four or five of, your, of these this student's teachers say, this student is pretty effective at expressing their critical thinking, but in science, you're, you're suggesting that their writing is not up to par. Could it be that they didn't understand the science they were writing about? It really allows us to ans ask much better questions about student performance. Um, and then, of course, to track growth over time. One of the tools we have in there is a growth focus tool, which, um, you know, we've seen lots of students who are excited because their teacher you know, says, oh, you know, you have a new growth focus this week. And the kids are excited because they know that after three weeks of getting the same growth focus, you know, it could be that they just have a bigger problem this week in some other area. But, <laughs> you know, in, in many cases, it's because they've taken ownership of one thing, knowing that, you know, in many cases, 
kids receive mixed messages from so many parents or so many teachers, they don't know how to kind of keep up. Um, but with the common language, they can really take ownership of specific aspects. It helps the teachers group students for conferencing, which they can do during the um, time when students are on Think Circa. And um, they can also, of course, as teachers, create their own lessons. So that is the kind of um, framework, and that's our technology that is designed to help students succeed on, on common core assessments, but also obviously just career and college readiness and in general, um, uh, you know, be effective communicators. So thank you for um, joining me. And I did record this presentation so I can share it with you. And um, I can also share the presentation with you. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to take them. Um, let me know. You can write them in the question box. So I see I have one question here, which is, are these assessments differentiated? Yes. Um, somebody asked, are the assessments differentiated? Differentiate? And the answer is yes, they are. Um, the Smarter Balanced is an adaptive test, which if you haven't taken them before, Smarter Balanced um, is essentially oops, a test that is designed to um, kind of assess where a student is. So there are um, sort of growth assessments built into Smarter Balanced with an end of year summative assessment. So in the growth assessment, students are going to be assessed not only in terms of where they're starting, but then where they progress throughout the year to give teachers, obviously, some feedback about instruction and how might, um, you might address a learning need. And then um, the summative assessment at the end of the year is obviously going to put a line in the sand in terms of where that student is in relation to where others at that grade level are or should be. Um, so yeah, the, the differentiated is, is adaptive, meaning that um, a student gets something wrong, they're given an easier question, they get something right, they're given a more challenging question. Um, it's sort of similar to MAP in that way, the measure of academic progress that NWEA has been doing for decades, and I think some other people use STAR, and there's other growth assessments that have worked in that way. Any other questions? I don't want to keep you because I already went a little bit over. Um, so I will uh, let you go and we will follow up with you and hope that we will hear back from you. We'd love for you to use Think Circa, the uh, free platform which offers a selection of readings, but also the subscription-based platform which is really designed to be a core supplement that can help teachers over the course of the school year, 40 weeks of instruction in English language arts, um, Next Generation Science Standards, the Social Studies C3 Frameworks, all of those um, lessons are available in the one system, along with the tools to create lessons from existing content and uh, obviously bring it into a paperless grading system and a dashboard of analytics that allow us to really focus on personalizing learning and achieving uh, growth for all students regardless of where they come in. So I hope that you'll explore the resource, and we'd love to hear from you. We're working with a lot of Wisconsin schools and, and, and love going up there. Uh, <laughs> we have a bunch of Marquette grads, actually, on the team who love to uh, visit Milwaukee. So hope to hear from you soon. Have a great day, and thanks for, for joining us. Take care.